Hello everyone this is part 8 of what if Deku married Jiro, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to share, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. It was done. Three long, grueling and arduous years with a plethora of peaks and valleys to brave, but it was done. All those enrolled had finished the curriculum of the Department of Heroes of UA High School and successfully graduated, yes, even Mineta and Bakugo, ready to lend a helping hand anytime, anywhere, from helping the elderly across the street to punting villains into prison. And more importantly, they can do so legally now, in the eyes of the law, without being reprimanded. For the hero course party rockers, dubbed as such by Izuku as they have gotten closer over the years, consisting of Ashido, Kaminari, Sero, Hagako, Kirishima, Tetsu Tetsu Tokage, Fukidashi and Kendo, this meant one thing, graduation P-A-A-A-R-R-R-T-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-
it's one favor, and he's not allowed to say the favor is to be given more favors, because that's lame. One favor from each of us for one kick-ass party. It's a good deal. I'm in. Sero said. I third the motion. Kirishima piped up. Hey if Eiji's in, so am I. Tetsu Tetsu nodded. Sorry, Itsuka. Fifth and sixth. Ashido raised her fists in the air with Hagakure, sporting a victorious smile. All right, fine. Kendo conceded, hanging her head in defeat. I swear, I'm so going to regret this, you heard them. Individual favors from us for a mind-blowing party plan. Do we have an accord? Yes. Pulling a notebook and pen seemingly out of nowhere, he began scribbling in the pages. First, the time. We can't just pull this off in one day for obvious reasons if you want to go out with a bang. In three to seven days, maybe. Many heads began nodding in agreement to Ashido's words. Sounds reasonable. Now, what kind of party style were you thinking? Nightclub. Block. Pool. College fraternity. This will change the venue depending on the answer, so the sooner we get an answer, the faster the work can progress. Nightclub or frat party sounds like the best option. Kendo thought aloud. There'd be a lot of things to go through for block parties or a pool party. Like paperwork and asking Yaoyorazu or Todoroki for their help. I personally think they wouldn't mind, but they did say they were planning their own family get-together, so that's a sensible choice. Fukidashi nodded. All right, so nightclub or frat style. Not exactly mutually exclusive in certain cases from what I've heard, but, ooh. I think I might know a place. That place in Kamino. Club Arc. Ran and owned by several retired pro heroes and police officers. I heard the pricing is relatively reasonable as well, the security's good, music's good, and food is good. The rooftop, Dot has a pool installed, I believe. Or was it a jacuzzi? Whichever. Oh. Dude. That sounds awesome. Kaminari grinned from ear to ear with an excited glow in his eyes. Wait, heard from. She works in the agency I intern at. You know Bubble Girl. Oh, yeah yeah, she has off days and likes blowing off steam in a club every now and then. It's pretty huge, so we can fan out and have fun. Without getting drunk, they're really strict about that. Hey, safety's always a good thing. Fucking hate those roofies. Kirishima growled. What kind of music though? Ashido eyed Izuku carefully. You know I can be picky. I don't know about who they bring in for the DJ, but according to their official website, they'll be doing a hip-hop memory lane, starting at the 80s, 90s, and then 2000s. It'll be starting, four days from now. And they would probably take song requests as well. Oh, I am going to have a motherfucking field day there during the party. Izuku Midoriya, I swear. If Ajiro wasn't my boyfriend I would take you right here on this rooftop right now with Kyoka. Woman, I'm right here. Kirishima growled indignantly at the horned, pink girl. Tetsu Tetsu failed to hold a snicker back. I'm kidding, Jesus, Ashido retorted with a teasing giggle, loosen up that puckered up ass of yours and take the stick out from there. Besides, you know you lube me. Moving on, Izuku said as he cleared his throat before raising his voice a little more than he intended to, the time. Not everyone lives in a convenient area to get to Kamino at a moment's notice, and we have train schedules and cab hailing to worry about if we stay too long. So we need to set a start time, then everyone can choose to stick around or leave to go to a smaller party of their own, whatever. But it needs to be early enough that people can get there, but late enough for the doors to actually open and have people other than you guys in it. I'm thinking somewhere between seven and half past. Sounds good. Kendo nodded. Okay, now the most important part, the number of people showing up. Because of the starting time, people may want to eat first, so we might as well have some finger food ready for them. Send out an RSVP to everyone and have them pitch in their share via Venmo. If there are people replying yes but don't show up, you guys are going to have to split the difference and chip in a little extra. I will contribute what I can as well. All the money needs to be funneled to one person. Kendo, would you mind? Not at all. Consider it done. Great. Izuku felt his phone vibrate in his pocket. There were two messages. Ida's about to leave the building, might want to catch him before he leaves to give him you know what. I'm having dinner with my parents but can we meet tonight at some point? Looking at the two messages displayed on the screen by Mei and Kyoka, respectively, he tossed the notebook to Kendo. All right, 
I got some places to go to before I go home. Make sure you pull the party off and follow the instructions. With your instructions, there is no way we are failing. You'd have to be an idiot. Kendo laughed softly to herself as Izuku sped away like a green comet as he quickly typed a reply. Hey, Tenya. Izuku called out as he was about to leave the building with his family including the still wheelchair-bound Tensei Ida, the former Ingenium. Oh, Izuku, hello. Your speech was, great. Very inspiring. Thanks. I actually had something written down but I didn't use it, if you believe that. Really. I was so nervous that it wouldn't be good enough, so. I tossed the script 10 minutes before getting up on the podium. You can still be just as nervous and jumpy as the day of the entrance exam, it seems. Ida chuckled. I miss the old you sometimes. Not that there's anything wrong with the current you. I guess the old me had its moments, I guess. You on the other hand, are turning into a really good drill sergeant in the making, just so you know. Team of Dayton's in good hands. As well as you a, eh, if you plan on becoming a teacher here at some point. I appreciate your confidence. I'd love to talk more but, is there something you needed from me right now? We were planning on going home and going out to a dinner reservation. Actually, yes. I need you to accept, this. From within the outer pocket of his grey blazer, Izuku pulled out a small, flat box and held it out. Okay. Ida tentatively took the box and opened it, revealing a transparent rectangular chip no bigger than a fingernail with blue geometrical lines running across it. What is this again? Another reason for you to celebrate. May and I started working on it during the second semester of our second year. It's a biostimulant implant. It took a long time, some advice and materials from my island delivered via Melissa, but we worked out most of the problems. This is only a prototype, but theoretically speaking, the three-year hiatus of your predecessor should come to an end after ample rehab and conditioning. Ida almost dropped the box upon hearing what Izuku said. As was Tensei and their parents who let the youngest son's diploma fall from their hands. You're, you're saying, my brother Seekan, H.H. He, Ida's damp eyes met the green-haired boy's own which were slightly higher than him now. Again, prototype. But once it's recalibrated and certain properties are tailored to his fitting, yes. He won't need a wheelchair, ever. I'm sorry I can't give you a more perfected model, but for what it's worth, it's functional and it's yours now. No returns. I, I, it's Izuku, you. Tears streamed down his face as his voice broke, hugging the box to him like it were his firstborn child. Save the thank you when we both know it actually works. Keep in touch, okay. I'll see you in the field. With that, Izuku sped off to rendezvous with his mother as he heard four shouts and cries of joy behind him. You got everything out of the way, sweetie. Talk to all your friends. Inko asked, as Izuku jogged up to her at the front gates of UA. Her eyes were still puffy from all the crying she had been doing since commencement began. Yes, I did. Sorry for making you wait. Oh, stop it. You've graduated from UA as valedictorian, I am about to let you get away with a lot of things today. Shall we head home? Yeah, but ah, uh, I, would you mind if I head out for a bit after dinner? Not at all. This is your day. This, dot all of this, is because you never gave up. Everything you have done up till now is all because of you. I am so, so proud of you Izuku, and I always will be. Izuku couldn't help but feel a little teary-eyed himself as he shook his head as he hugged his mother close. He still couldn't believe how such a small woman could be so strong to be a parent. A parent of a soon-to-be hero, no less. It started with you though. Because you gave birth to me, because you decided to have me in your life and let me walk the path of a hero is why all of this was made possible. Everything. You may have, given up on me once upon a time, but you still were there for me. Always. Every step of the way. I may look up to All Might as the hero I want to become, but, my very, very first hero in this world that I know of is you. Always you. And I love you for that, mom. Inko sobbed as her son placed a hand on her back, fighting back tears. From the window, unbeknownst to her, Izawa and All Might stared down at him. In the brief moment he gave a curt nod, Izuku swore he saw the faintest smile on the lips of the perpetually fatigued, ever stoic pragmatist. All Might simply gave him a big, skeletal smile as well as a peace sign which Izuku returned. Mom, get on my back. I'll carry you home. 
It'll save costs on the train fare. Wareep. She squealed a little being hoisted onto her son's back like a child. Hang tight. Carrying Inko on her back while holding onto her things, Izuku activated one for all at his full capacity of 42%, the heat of the energy coursing through his body as he went full cowl. With a single bound, they were airborne. The wind in his face, whispering in his ear as if to encourage him to go higher, faster, and the view, everything about it made traversing the terrain on foot, well, fun. His mother was absolutely terrified of the speed and velocity for the first few minutes or so, shouting and pleading to just walk and take the train back home which soon turned into incoherent shouts. Mom, do not pass out on me right now. Please. In a matter of minutes, their apartment came into view, at which moment Izuku deactivated his quirk and set Inko down, who was disheveled and out of breath. I I Izuku Midoriya, I swear on everything that is holy on this green earth, if you do that again before I say you can, I am going to throw out every single All Might memorabilia in your room and set it on fire. In front of you. Please God no, not that. Anything but that. I'm I'm sorry. I will do anything, just please don't do that. Anything. Yes. Absolutely anything at all. I will cook dinner if I must. Then after dinner, go see Kyoka and take her out on a date. Really. But, it's. I understand it's at night. You're 18, you're growing into an adult and therefore you are allowed to make more decisions on your own. Just make sure you're back by 10.31pm, understood? Yes. Thanks mom. It was about 7.45pm when Kyoka tackled Izuku with a hug from behind, nearly flattening him on the ground. Hey there, nerd extraordinaire. Kyoka greeted him with a warm smile and a big damn kiss that made onlookers blush and look away. Both were pretty confident that not even Isa were popping up behind them would deter them at that point. Congrats on being valedictorian. Another step closer to your dream, right? Yeah, thanks. Congrats on graduating to you too. Izuku brushed the girl's hair out of her face and kissed her on the forehead, making her hum in pleasure. So, Sappho again. Yup. I know we still have time, but I wanted to give you a proper send-off before you leave me. Izuku frowned in confusion. I'm not breaking up with you. You're going across the ocean to another fucking continent in less than two weeks. I can't kiss you across the ocean, dumbass. There was happiness and encouragement in Kyoka's heart for Izuku's conviction to go the distance for his dreams, but genuine anger and sadness resided in her eyes as well, essentially for prioritizing his dreams over her. She knew reprimanding him for that was selfish and stupid, but it was what love does to a person. I'll bet you're going to drown your sorrows in Melissa's lips and tits once you get there. Kyoka, how can you say that? I just miss you already, okay? As much as I want you to succeed, I want you here. With me. Burying her face in her boyfriend's chest, Kyoka felt her voice breaking. She could stand a week, two weeks, or even a couple months at the most, but several years was going to be utter torture. Quote comma dot dot. Why do you have to go overseas? I just, staying in Japan won't widen my gaze about heroism, or about this world we live in, for that matter. I need to see for myself. Believe me, if I had the choice to take you with me, I would. I really would. Running his fingers through the dark purple hair, Izuku patted her on the back as her arms tightened around him more. But there's only one slot. And, I don't know if I'll be able to skip a grade or something, but if I do, I will come back to you ASAP. Okay. Also that thing between us and Melissa that happened on Christmas Eve was because someone spiked the eggnog with bourbon. I know. But let's face it, I didn't hate it, you didn't hate it, and she most certainly didn't hate it. C.A. Can we change the subject, please? Izuku blushed as he looked away. That was, an accident. A surprisingly happy one with no dire consequences, but an accident nonetheless. One that we agreed to never speak of. Right. Sorry, just, reminiscing. Spitefully. I still love you though. I know. But I love you more. After another kiss, they walked towards Sappho for their second makeover with Fletcher, the Flash. They were welcomed with open arms and ushered to the back room in full view of the other customers. Ah, it is so nice to hear back from you again. I'm glad you reconsidered doing this for that one time only. Well, he's going to be studying abroad, so I figured that having one more memory to go out with a bang before he leaves would be a good idea. So, are we doing the thing I suggested? Oh, yes we are. 
Fletcher smiled. Izuku frowned as Kyoka began playing the pronoun game with Fletcher. Doing what thing? Kyoka, what have you done? It's not bad. Okay. Come on. The clothes are already in the changing room. Pushing Izuku behind the curtains, she entered the other room to change. Oh my word. Look at you two, all grown up and looking like a menace to society. Fletcher chuckled as they both emerged. Aside from the long-hemmed, low-cut white shirt with a design of glass pierced and cracked by bullets, Izuku was covered in black from head to toe. Over the shirt he wore a simple leather jacket of a classic style, adorned with epaulettes, a shearing stand-up collar, ribbed upper sleeves, the belt, an asymmetrical zipper, sleeve zippers and front flap pockets. His pants were slightly faded black denim, complete with footwear that were buckled boots that stopped a quarter of the way up the shins. Um, I think there's too much black in this. That's exactly why you're wearing it, nerd boy. I'm corrupting the shit out of you before any of those bitches get the grubby hands on All Might's secret lover chilled. Wait, what? Fletcher jerked his head around. You're his. Don't worry, it's an inside joke. And Kyoka, we've been over this, you've seen what my dad looks like. Kyoka giggled as she stepped out to reveal herself dressed in what Izuku could only describe as a mix of sporty, retro hipster and a splash of ghetto-style fashion. She donned a white, wide neck shirt that bared her shoulders and tank top and cuffed grey harem pants with two lines in navy blue running down the outside of each pant leg. Her feet had tan timberlands fitted on and on top of all this was a loose-fitting olive drab fishtail jacket with a hood lined with fur, baggy sleeves adorned with a dozen or so studded patches on one and a white patterned bandana wrapped around the odd coloured red sleeve and a long hem that came down to her knees. All you need is a baseball bat and a background of a brick wall with graffiti to look like a genuine hoodlum from the back streets of Naruhata. Finishing the outfit by putting on a black choker that she owned, she replied smugly, I'll take that as a compliment. Rolling up the jacket sleeves, Kyoka make a gang sign with fingernails painted black and stuck her tongue out, sporting a cool but rather adorable devil may care attitude. Now, if you two will just follow me outside. Fletcher motioned as he exited the back room with a brisk pace along with Kyoka, leaving a confused Izuku scrambling after them before he lost sight. Ah, where exactly are we going? He asked, eyeing his petite girlfriend suspiciously. Hair salon. You know the one that does nails and spray paint tattoo on the side. We already did version 2.0 of us on our first year, so now we're taking it another five steps further by getting our hair done as well. I already have one picked out for you, just so you know. It's going to be an undercut. Short version. What? This was a bad dream. While he had nothing against getting a haircut every now and then to keep his hair manageable on his own, he never, ever radically deviated from what he had on his head. Maybe a little product to change things up subtly, but never to the point that would require a professional's intervention. He had no idea what exactly an undercut was, but the fact that his hair was going to be hewn short just felt, indescribably unsettling. No, no 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 no, I am not. You're picking my hairstyle as well, so don't back out on me now. We're fucking doing this, and we're taking pictures. Here, I have a couple choices. Pick one before we get there. Izuku caught Kyoka's phone which she callously tossed over her shoulder like an entitled and fickle celebrity would to her agent. The screen set on the memo function page had a list of at least half a dozen hairstyles without pictures. Thanks to the notebooks for the first makeover date, he had a faint idea where they were going, which meant he now had less than three minutes and counting at the pace they were going at. Um, ah, uh, okay, this. The razor cut pixie. Ooh, very, very good choice, young man. Very good. Despite the lack of background, your acumen and intuition for her style is remarkable. Have you reconsidered becoming a model yet? You are doing this for a second time, after all. Or would you prefer being a designer? It's, we'll, maybe. It's just a maybe. We're doing this for fun. Like I told my friends before, I'm trying to be a pro hero first and foremost, not a fashion icon. A little weak for an argument, considering people like Rukyu, Uabami and Best Genist are considered contemporary fashion leaders. Rukyu and Uabami I can understand, but Best Genist is like that almost exclusively for denim. That's why he's called Best Genist, for crying out loud. It's really ironic because his quirk is literally known as Fiber Master. He does have a point there, Mr. Fletcher, Kyoka nodded, Best Genist usually does have some form of denim be it blue or otherwise on him. 
it doesn't do justice to the variety department. Well, you know where to reach me should you decide to take the spotlight as a rising star in fashion. Oh we'll give it a shot, once he comes back from his study abroad. Right, Kyoko muttered through gritted teeth, glaring at Izuku over her shoulder. Um, we'll, we'll see. Izuku didn't think he'd ever have to choose a tattoo in his life and never planned to, regardless of the fact that it was impermanent and would wash off in about a week and a half or shorter with a good scrub. He chose relatively subtle Celtic runes, but they were sprayed onto areas that were not so subtle, such as the sides of his neck and around the clavicle. The only relatively subtle one was a small, tribal design feather on the inside of his right wrist which Kyoka insisted on getting in the same exact spot. My mom is in a pretty good mood, but if she catches me with tattoos of any kind until I'm actually a gainfully employed member of society, she isn't just going to stop at disowning me. She will strangle me using her apron. Oh relax. I already texted her that I was going to borrow you for the night and we were doing some unspecified stuff together, and she already loves me like her own. You'll be fine. Izuku kept passing his fingers along the side and back of his head that had been pillaged with a pair of shears and the top trimmed about an inch or so nervously. His head quite literally felt lighter and breezier. Kyoka and Fletcher assured him he looked like an intimidating biker, once he got the veracity face onto which he retorted that he didn't have a bike. Both of them only smiled at that, walking to the food court on the first floor. Kyoka waved at someone, and Izuku saw a gloved hand, one that belonged to a girl with very familiar pink dreadlocks swept to the right wearing a jumpsuit with the sleeves tied around her waist. She was leaning on a large object covered in a blue tarp. May, what's she doing here? I'm here to deliver my baby, silly. Why else would I be here? Okay, can you not say that first sentence out loud in public? Please. Is it done? Kyoka asked, ignoring Izuku's plea. Oh yes. May's yellow irises with crosshairs twinkled. This beast of a baby is good. Two. Goo. Beast of a baby. What exactly did you make? Think of this as, a graduation present from us three. Us. Three. Izuku looked around in confusion. There was nobody there, rightly so, aside from them and Fletcher. I'm number three. A female voice made Izuku jump as May held up a tablet that displayed the face of a very familiar looking young woman with shimmering golden hair that reached below her shoulders. Hi, Izuku. Again, congratulations on graduating with honors from UA. As your honorary older sister, I am so proud of you. Melissa. What the, dot you had a hand in this. Melissa Shield. Another person, who like the previous Izuku, is quirkless, but clawed her way to the top as one of the brightest minds that I Island has to offer through focus, commitment and sheer power of will. She was one of the many people that Izuku respected in life. They had only met during that incident with Wolfram before she came for the commencement ceremony, looking more beautiful than he remembered, objectively speaking, since nobody could outdo Kyoka in that regard. Yup. Girlfriend here decided she was going to get you something equally badass as the rockabilly, so I gave her a couple of suggestions, and she brought it over to May here, who by the way, is an amazing girl with an amazing mind that I'm excited to meet. And after a couple of minutes deliberating our choices, we decided that we were going to get you this. May's hands tapped on the blue tarp. You already got your license to drive a car and now a motorcycle, right? Yeah. Why? Oh no, no, you didn't. No, no way, is that? Yes we did, Izuku. May, show him our beast of a baby. With pleasure, here we go. Without missing a beat, May's hands flung the tarp off the object, revealing a fully customized motorcycle painted black and green with a streak of pinkish purple around the tank in all its hulking glory with two helmets resting on the seats. Behold the baby Frankenstein, two parts adventure, one part naked, one part cruiser, and all parts of unadulterated awesomeness. What, dot the, fuck, is this beast? Holy fucking shit. The usual cheerful but composed demeanor of Izuku was replaced by full-blown ecstatic joy at the masterpiece he was staring at. He couldn't tell what the maker or model was, but it was beyond anything that the catalogs of the customized models could ever begin to even match, much less surpass. This technologically tricked out bad boy is called Gem. The green-eyed monster, since you're so jealous and possessive of me. Kyoka snickered. It was your girlfriend's idea, Melissa smiled as she crossed her arms, clearly pleased at the reaction of her friend. You got her the rockabilly, so it was only fair she got you something equally awesome if not more awesome. 
It started off with scrounging up junk parts of the faux villains that were used in the entrance exams that UA kept around. I fixed what was broken or warped to piece together however much was possible, but we eventually ran out of parts to root through and there were still some missing, so I called in some help. Which is where I come in, Melissa continued, and I was happy to oblige. I did have a spare engine lying around from an old experiment that was in good condition among other things, and it's for Izuku. So I thought, what the hell why not? Izuku went up to the two girls and embraced them, pulling them off their feet. While Kyoka simply took it in stride, Mei turned into a beat red stuttering mess, almost dropping the tablet. Thank you so much, all of you. Don't sweat it, Izuku. I'll see you once you touch down on US soil. Say hi to Uncle Might for me. And I want my hug once you get here. I will. Good. The screen turned blank and Melissa's image disappeared. Okay, we have everything we need. Motorcycle, rider, passenger, and mechanic. Give me five minutes and I'll have the cameraman here. Hang tight. Once Fletcher left, Kyoka pulled Izuku and Mei into a group hug. Thank you so much. This thing is, it's amazing. I absolutely love it. All right, since you like it so much, I think you ought to show Mei your appreciation in a slightly more forward and intimate way. Wait, what? Mei stared at Kyoka in disbelief. Kyoka, do I want to know where this is going? I think you do because I am giving you permission to kiss her. She uttered in a nonchalant shrug. If she wants it, that is. I, you um. It was a rare sight to see a motor mouth like Mei rendered speechless. What? Izuku's facial redness quickly began rising. Let's face it, she's roughly about your height and has big curves in all the right places. And we talked about this before. As long as you, the third parties and I agree to the boundaries set beforehand and I'm present in the room for whatever happens, it's okay. We're four for four, so it's worked out well so far, statistically. Wait, four for? Dot you, you've done, this before. May asked slowly. Ah, uh, yeah, we have. Izuku mumbled, averting his gaze bashfully. With, with whom, if I may ask. I won't tell anyone, obviously. Should I? Izuku turned to Kyoka, cocking his head to one side. Once she gave him a silent nod, he answered, in chronological order, Melissa Shield which was an accident, Setsuna Tokage which wasn't, Tomoko Shitoko aka Ragdoll, which, just kinda happened, and Psycho Intelli who for some reason Kyoka felt the need to seduce and succeeded. I don't hear you complaining, nerd boy. She was lesbian but you totally turned her into a full-on bi girl, by the way. Kyoka snickered. Ah, fun afternoon, that was. Wah, okay, I don't think I want to hear the rest of that. Mei shut her eyes and shook her head with a heaving sigh. A, to avoid, dot you know, problems in general, we tried our best to stay away from people that were in UA. Izuku, you, dot you may look docile, but you're quite the silver-tongued womanizing son of a bitch aren't you? I don't know if I should backhand you across the face or applaud. Usually option one is the normal reaction when you have real-life examples like Captain Celebrity. Izuku laughed softly at Mei's comment, scratching his head. You're not a sleaze like that arrogant fuck. Unlike that overgrown fuckboy who will throw himself at anyone with a big ass in tight jeans and low self-esteem, you have boundaries, standards, and me. Besides, it's not like you haven't kissed each other before. Remember when you literally had to hold your guts in with your hand because of Toga's new knife. And on top of that, Shigaraki came very close to vaporizing your leg. That was different. Izuku insisted. Excessive blood loss made me go into shock. Mei had the same O positive blood type as me so she patched me up, gave me a transfusion and did CPR. That doesn't and shouldn't count as kissing. At all. I was about to fucking die. You literally slapped me later for getting hurt and reopened a wound. Why yeah. Making curd, albeit with less conviction than usual. What? What he said? May, stop bullshitting me. And you. I can hear your heartbeat and it's saying you want my hot nerd's lips on you again. Properly this time. Don't worry, he won't bite or strip, unless you want him to. She winked. But just so you know, if you go for more than a minute kissing him, it will feel like he's brain fucking you with his magic tongue and hands. Kyoka, for the love of God, stop. We're in public. What? I'm just telling her what to expect should she say yes, calm down. Jesus fuck. Oh and hurry up and decide before the cameraman gets here. May, 
you can say no, you know that, right. You have every right to refuse and I most certainly will not hold that decision against you until the end of time. I know, just, okay, sure. Yes. May mumbled after a long pause. Um, sorry, run that by me again. I'm still processing all this, but I said it's okay. CPR or not, you were the first person I had lip-on-lip -lip contact with in this life, so, dot and, you know. I don't exactly dislike you. May chuckled nervously. I kinda got that, if Jem and other past projects weren't indications. Great, it's settled. After the photoshoot then, somewhere quiet. And more private. Whoa, whoa, wait. I still didn't. Alright, now that we have everything, we can begin. Fletcher clapped his hands together excitedly. We'll set up. The concept is, partners in crime. Let me handle this. Kyoka smiled. Izuku, you get on the bike. May, rest on the handlebars from behind. Aha, uh -huh, like that. And I will be, right here. Kyoka leaned against the tandem seat, the jacket slightly falling off her shoulders to show off the tattoos. Oh, very nice. MMMHMM. Musme, look towards the lens a little more, if you would please. Yes, right there. Are my creative juices are positively flowing right now? Yes. Now try something a little more, combative. An artistic reaction to someone trying to cut in on your action, as it were. Izuku. Your call. Kyoka nudged. Okay, how's this? Veracity mixed with a hint of anger and a crazy smile with teeth as he ran his fingers through his newly styled short hair. One arm went around Kyoka's shoulders, showing off the tattoo on the wrist which Kyoka followed suit with her own pose. The other arm simply rested on May's shoulder, gingerly. Ah, May, would you mind leaning your head towards me a little? Like this. Yup. Now um, dot put your hand on mine. Sandwich that hand between my hand and your head. Okay, easy enough. MMM, very nice. Let's try, Amaris for the next few. Amaris towards him or us? Kyoka asked. Whichever you feel comfortable with. Let's do this one at a time then. Sitting on the motorcycle backwards, he made a beckoning motion with one finger. Kyoka sauntered up to him, sticking her tongue out while wearing a sly smile, just out of reach, the jacket falling off her shoulders. Next up was with Mei who reclined on the seat as Izuku's hand closed around her wrist. The photoshoots went on, some individual, some in pairs, and some with all three in various positions both with and without Jem, just barely towing the line that made it risque. Once they wrapped everything up, Fletcher bade them farewell. Now then, for the moment we've all been waiting for. Mei, you have the keys. Actually, you don't need it. Watch. Placing a hand on the accelerator, May spoke, Gem baby, start up. The engine roared to life and the headlight turned on, casting a beam of light ahead the trio. Oh, that is sick. Theft proof with complete countermeasures and autopilot. Right now it only has my voice as an activation key. Hang on. Gem baby, create spare key. Izuku, say your name and put your hand on the throttle. Right. Izuku Midoriya. With a tiny blip, the headlight flickered. Now you can ride this baby anytime you feel like it. Take it for a spin. What about you though? Kyoka asked. Jem can't take more than two without us getting arrested. Not to worry. You might want to take like, three steps back. Jem baby, deploy sidecar. Within five seconds, part of the motorcycle's body disengaged and reassembled itself into a simple sidecar apparatus as it reconnected. Boo. Hot dar a a a a m n. Kyoka laughed as she clapped her hands excitedly. All right, let's go. We'll go safe and sound first. Izuku stated clearly as he pulled the full face helmet on and snapped the visor down. Okay, field test time. Let's see how this baby does on the road. May giggled as she pulled her own red and pink helmet with goggles down. Fine by me. Kyoka grinned as she tightly wrapped her arms around Izuku's waist. Operating the clutch lever and shifting gears, Izuku slowly twisted the throttle and rode out onto the night road. So, what do I think? May asked through the radio built into the helmet. This baby is the freaking crown jewel I didn't know I needed. I was a little apprehensive at first, but now, I have no qualms kissing you. Good to know, thank you. You said somewhere private, where did you have in mind? Hmm. Jem has GPS, right. Izuku, don't insult my intelligence or I won't kiss you. May warned, clearly offended by the inquiry. 
Right. Dumb question. Sorry. Gem baby, plot a course to a relatively deserted public area with a nice view. Several blips later, the inside of Izuku's helmet lit up as it gave him instructions of the route to take as well as an ETA. Gem baby. Izuku asked before he tightened his grip around the throttle, play the trap remix of tequila. This is an amazing view. Jogging course near the ferry terminal to Ashuri Offshore International Airport, huh? Why didn't I think of that? Because while you can drive well, you obviously don't know how to use Gem Baby at full potential. But he'll learn so don't worry. May gave the cow a reassuring pat before pulling her helmet off. Gem only chirped in response which most likely was supposed to emote something along the lines of, take your time. Well, it may not have been a magic carpet ride, but that was very smooth. Kudos to Gem and the driver. Kyoka hopped off the back and pulled Izuku into a kiss. And of course, the grand architect. It's my turn now, I guess. May asked as she stood up to stretch her legs out. I'm not going to judge you for backing out. No, I I want to. And since your girlfriend said yes, I'm going to do it before she backs out of her consent. I never have. There's a first time for everything. You ready? She turned towards Izuku with her lips drawn into a thin line, obviously nervous. Ready as I'll ever be, May. All right, I'll keep my head turned the other way, but if I hear zippers and clothes hitting the ground, you're both getting a jack in the eye. Quote comma dot. Is she always this clingy? May chuckled in an effort to divert her mind from what she was about to do with someone already taken. Yeah, she means well though. You want me to start or do you? You're the more experienced one, so I think you should. Her heart began jumping, higher and higher every other two seconds as she squeezed her eyes shut. Fair enough. Closing the remaining distance between them, Izuku's lips lightly touched against hers as he lifted May's face up slightly. Counting to ten in his mind, he took a half step back, peeling his lips away. So, how's your first actual kiss? It was, floaty. And it tasted like mint and chocolate. If you want more, just say the word. Then, Dot can I kiss you this time, Izuku. With a nod from him, May pressed herself against him, slowly feeling him up through the leather. He responded to every shape she changed her lips in, his hand simply cupping her face, taking it all in. His fingers wandered through her pink locks, massaging her scalp, making her stand on her toes and arch her back. She moaned slightly into the kiss before pulling back, gasping. Oh. My god. Dot wow. Brain fuck. Indeed. Any more and she was confident that an orgasm would be within an arm's reach. Or. You didn't hit the minute mark. Kyoka pouted. Here. Allow me to show you what he will do when he really, really gets worked up. Come here. Babe. Let me start your engine. Oh. Very funny. Izuku rolled his eyes, but embraced Kyoka his arms slipping inside the jacket and sneaking up her back. Lightly pulling him down by the shortened hair, she claimed his lips hungrily, lightly chewing on them from time to time. And by God, it never got old. His hands lightly groping her ass over the fabric of the clothing, his fingers caressing her earlobes, the tightness of his embrace, everything was a roller coaster ride. She opened her eyes to steal a glance at May, who was staring at this spectacle, swallowing hard. Now seemed like a good time as any. Phew, dot and, there you have it, May. Still want some more. I know I do. And he does. Again, totally up to you, Izuku reminded, clamping a hand over his clearly turned on girlfriend's mouth before she made any further advances. We can drive straight to your place, drop you off and. My house is actually empty right now, so being dropped off there won't really do me any good. Mom's home so my place is a no-go. Izuku shuddered at the thought of what would befall him should his mother find not just one but two unclothed girls in his room. Death would be the least of his problems. Same here. Kyoka huffed. May, we can, keep you company. As they say, three's a party. Quote comma dot dot. Are you trying to seduce me? Do you want to be seduced? Kyoka asked playfully. You did just kiss Izuku. Twice. Well, I, I did like the kissing. She had to admit, he was good. The kiss was gentle, but attentive and accommodating, eagerly doing everything May wanted but never overstepping. Plus, the new haircut and biker outfit definitely helped. The second wind of puberty had utterly transformed him for the better. Even she had to admit to some degree that Izuku was fucking hot. 
Upon their first contact, he was simply someone that would boost her chances for the companies to notice her babies, but his pathological nerdiness about quirks and heroes persisted, turned him into a constant stream of inspiration. There was no shortage of ideas he provided for new support items, upgrades, and variations according to the environment. Pro heroes that took a step back from the front lines for making and improving support items were not unheard of, but were extremely rare. Izuku was probably going to be the first in a long while that would not only dabble but actively fight battles on two fronts. For that, she couldn't help but respect him for his support and be impressed with his brain's flexibility and ingenuity. Plus, it was kind of a big deal when someone willingly volunteers to test items out that were more likely than not to turn you into a piece of charcoal for three consecutive years and manages to save your life from villains, out-of-control gadgets, and self-destructive tendencies like not sleeping or eating. But, if if we're doing this, Dot and we are doing this, unless I'm misinformed, just so you know. I I'm still, a virgin. Thanks for telling us that, but don't worry, Kyoko reassured the reddening Pinkett with a hug, he's super gentle until you give him the go ahead. Plus, another woman's touch to take the edge off your nerves never hurt anybody, right? I, I guess, Izuku, give her another big smooch. I can smell her nervousness in the air. May was more than happy to let him as the tip of his hot tongue touched against the inside of her lips. But then he suddenly pulled away, looking pale. Oh crap, what time is it right now? Around 9.50pm. Why, I gotta get back in about half an hour. If this is about your mom, I got you covered. On the way here I asked your mom via text that a mutual friend at school asked us for help to test out a couple of support gadgets meant for nighttime use and we may end up taking a little longer than usual or even end up sleeping over before she got you back. I mean, there was a bit of back and forthing but she said yes. We have all the time in the world. The sly grin said it all. Kyoko had planned this. That will be all for this video, be sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment down below for more videos, goodbye.